This is EE698i, mixed signal IC design. And this is lecture number 12. In the last class, we were discussing about the thermal noise associated with the resistor. And we saw that the voltage noise power spectral density, the single sided power spectral density is 4 KTR volts square per hertz, where R is the resistor value, K is the Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. We also saw that when we have a first order RC circuit like this, the output voltage, that is the voltage across the capacitor, has a power spectral density, which is a filtered version of this white noise. And it is given by 4 kPr by 1 plus 4 pi square s square r square c square so if you look at the graph it will look something like this it starts from 4 ktr and then rolls off like this and you also saw that the mean squared value or the power of the output voltage which is essentially the area under this curve turns out to be kt by c and although initially this result looks surprising because of the fact that the mean squared value seems to be independent of the resistor which is the reason why we have noise in the first place we got ourselves convinced that this result indeed makes sense because when we increase the resistor value two things happen one is the power spectral density 4 ktr increases and at the same time, the RC bandwidth reduces. So these two effects exactly cancel each other, making the final mean squared value independent of the resistor. And when we had a sampling network like this, the samples of this output voltage, we have often, we saw that this had a white power spectral density if the RC time constant is very much less than TS by 2. And in our sampling network, this is indeed true because we choose the RC time constant to be much smaller than the settling interval in order to make sure that the output voltage tracks the input voltage. Right? And in this case, the sampled noise has a white power spectral density from 0 to pi. And we also saw that the mean squared value of these noise samples, the out square of n, is again kt by c. Right? So when we have an input voltage and we try to sample the input using a switch like this, the output samples not only consist of the input samples, but it also has contribution due to the thermal noise. I'll call V and T of it. And you know that this has a mean squared value of KT by C. Now, although we considered only a resistor, even when we use a MOSFET as a switch like this, The mean squared noise will still be kt by c because even for a mosfet operating in a triode region which is how we'll operate the mosfet when we use it as a switch the voltage noise power spectral density is 4 kt r on where r on is the on resistor of this mosfet in triode region okay So the bottom line is whenever we sample the input along with the input samples, we'll also be sampling this thermal noise. And this is something fundamental and we cannot avoid this. So let us say we have a differential input. In that case, we'll have two sampling networks like this. One sampling 
the positive input, say V in one, and the other sampling the other differential half, V in two, both are R and C. Okay. And V in one, we will give it as VCM plus some delta V in of T. And of course, VCM we know is VDD by two. Right. Similarly, V in two is VCM minus delta V in of T. Right. So when we take the samples of this, they call it the O1 of N. This is going to have VCM plus delta V in of N plus the noise sample because of this resistor. And let's say call it VNT one of N. Similarly, I'll have in the other half, the samples will be VCM minus delta V in of N plus the noise sample because of this resistor. And let us say that is some VNT2 of N. So if I take the differential output, So this is simply two delta V in of N plus V in T1 of N minus V in T2 of N, right? So this is my differential noise that is getting sampled. So we'll just call V in T diff. And what is the mean squared value of this noise? Well, we know that these two noise samples Right, they are uncorrelated right, because they arise from two independent noise sources like this. So these two have no relation to each other. That is the noise generated by these two resistors have no relation to each other. So the noise samples here are uncorrelated. Okay. So since these two noise samples are uncorrelated, the mean squared value of the difference, they call the NTD squared of N, that is simply be the sum of the mean squared values, right? Well, because uh, mean squared value is simply expected value of VNTD squared, that is simply VNT1 minus VNT2 whole squared, and this is simply VNT1 squared plus expected value of VNT2 squared minus two times expected value of VNT1 times VNT2. And since these two samples are uncorrelated, if you take the expected value of their product, that's going to be zero, right? So the overall mean square value is simply two KT by C because each of them has a mean squared value given by KT by C. Okay. So if you look at the fully differential output, the OD of N, that is two delta V in of N plus the sample differential thermal noise V in TD of N. And we know that this has a variance of 2KT by C. And what is the maximum differential sinusoidal input we can apply? Well, that is a sinusoid with an amplitude VDD, right? So it can be VDD into sine omega n, right? So what is the maximum signal power? That is simply VDD squared by two. So if you look at the noise now, we have two components. One is the sample thermal noise. And that has a power of two KT by C, right? And we'll also have quantization noise when we do quantization. And that has a power of 
delta square by 12. Right? So overall in the ADC, we will have two noise contributions, one from the thermal noise and one from the quantization noise. So now we have three choices, either to make the thermal noise dominant or the quantization noise to be dominant or make both of them equally strong. And usually depending on the design, we make one of them to be the dominant one. For example, if you find that reducing quantization noise is easier, we do that and make the design to be dominant by dominated by the thermal noise. And if you find that it is easy to reduce the thermal noise in some design, you reduce the thermal noise and make the ADC to be quantization noise limited. Okay, so finally, in most of the cases, you will find that the ADC is either thermal noise limited or quantization noise limited. Now, let us say you want to make uh, the ADC to be quantization noise limited. So what we have to do, we need to make sure that the thermal noise, which I call NT, to be less than the quantization noise NQ. So which means 2KT by C should be less than delta square by 2. Now we know delta is the step size of the quantizer and it is 2 V ref by 2 power N. That's simply 2 V D D by 2 power N, right? And N is the effective resolution or the effective number of bits we want for the ADC. And so from the given resolution, that is the target resolution, we can find what is delta square by 12. Okay. And then from this, we can choose the thermal noise power, right? And from this value of thermal noise power, we can calculate what is the value of the sampling capacitor we need. Okay. And once we know what is the sampling capacitor C, we can find the on resistance. How can we find it? Well, we know that when we are trying to sample an input like this, we wish to make the RC time constant R on time C to be much, much smaller than this sampling interval or the tracking interval available for us. Right. So from this condition, we can fix some value for R on time C. And from this, we can back calculate what is the required value of R on. And this switch in turn can either be a CMOS switch. And if you, if you want much better linearity, we can use a gate bootstrap switch. Right. And this is again, assuming that we are tracking some time varying input. And irrespective of the choice of the switch, we need to choose the length of the transistor that is used as a switch to be the minimum length so that we get the least possible on resistance and then choose the width of the transistor accordingly to get the desired on resistance. Okay, so that's how we'll choose the values of R and C in a sampling network. Now, let's say, for example, we try to design a 10 bit ADC. And let's say VDD is 1 volt for us. Now, this 10 bit implies that the signal to noise ratio is 62 dB roughly, right? And the maximum signal power is what? Since VDD is 1 volt. The maximum signal power is one half, that is minus three dB. And these two imply that the total noise power must be less than minus 65 dB, right? And this noise power is a sum of both the thermal and the quantization noise. And now let us say I wish to make the thermal noise power to be half that of the quantization noise power. So in that case, what do I get? I get the total noise power to be 3NT and this should be minus 65 dB, right? So which implies uh, 10 log 3 plus NT value in dB. This should be minus 65 
and this gives the value of the thermal noise power in dB to be around minus 70 dB, right? Because 10 log 3 is around 5 dB. So since the thermal noise power is 2 kT by C, this should be around 10 power minus 7. And from this, we can calculate what is the value of C. So C is 2 kT into 10 power 7. So at room temperature of 300 Kelvin, KT values 4.14 uh, into 10 power minus 21 joules. So this times 10 power 7. So that gives around how much? Uh, this is minus 14. So it's around 82 femtofarad. So roughly it's of the order of some 100 femtofarad. Okay. So this is how we can find what is the value of the sampling capacitor we need. And let us say, in this case, we saw that the sampling capacitor needed is some 100 femtofarad, right? So instead of using this value of 100 femtofarad, what if we use, let us say, capacitance that is 10 times higher? So let's say use the sampling capacitance of 1 picofarad. Of course, this reduces the thermal noise power by 10 times. But what is the price we'll be paying? Again, I suggest you pause the video and think about it. Well, what will happen if you increase the capacitance value? Then more than what you need is the following. In a CMOS process, capacitor is usually implemented using a metal insulator metal or shortly known as min capacitor. So where we essentially realize the capacitance using two parallel metal sheets. So something like this. Okay. So this is my top plate and bottom plate, right? And we have some dielectric field in between. This could be silicon dioxide or something else. Okay. And this is essentially realizing the capacitance using a parallel plate structure. So we know that the capacitance is going to be directly proportional to the area, right? So if you choose a higher value for the capacitance, the area occupied by the capacitor will also increase. And this will overall increase the area of the ADC and hence the cost of the ADC as well. And in a CMOS process, there is one other way in which we usually realize capacitance, and that is called metal oxide metal or a mom cap, where what we do is the following. We take this top plate, and instead of having a simple sheet like this, so we try to have a structure like this. So again, this is a 3D structure, so not the drawings. So let me just roughly show it like this. Okay. And we take the same metal and arrange it like this here. Okay. So essentially this metal is arranged like this, right? And similarly, we'll have one more structure at the bottom also. And now let us say uh, these two plates are connected and these two metals are connected. So what will happen is the following. Along with having the electric fields in this direction, okay, here we also have electric fields in this direction. So this capacitance structure exploits this lateral flux also. Okay. And here again, the capacitance value will depend on the area. So again, if you need a larger value for the capacitance, you need to occupy a much larger area. And this will in turn increase the cost. And even if you say you're not worried about the area, there is something else that will happen if you increase the capacitance value, which is the following. So this is our sampling network. Right? 
and usually we'll have some circuitry sitting before this ADC that will be driving this ADC, right? So usually this could be some kind of a voltage buffer, right? So this is my V in, this will be my V in, and this is P out, right? So if I look at the current flowing in this direction, if I call it as I out, what is I out? I out is simply V in minus V out by R. If I call on resistance as R on, this is R on, right? And of course, this current will flow only when we close the switch, right? And let's see what will happen when we just close the switch. So let's say this is my control signal for the switch. So let's say I call it t equal to zero. So which means I'm closing the switch at t equal to zero. And let's say the capacitor is initially uncharged. So what will happen? The capacitor voltage V out will start from zero, right? And it will try to increase, right? And since the capacitor value starts from zero volt, what will happen to the current? Well, V out is zero. So the current will be V in by R on. So if I plot the current also, that will initially jump to V in by R on. Right? And as the capacitance voltage increases because of this current flowing, what will happen? V out will increase. So the current will also reduce. So the current will simply decay to zero like this. And the capacitor voltage will slowly settle to V in. Okay. So the maximum current that we require to charge this capacitor is V in by R on, right? And this current has to be provided by this circuitry, this buffer sitting before the ADC. So the current consumption of this buffer will be determined by this maximum current, right? So now let us say use a much larger capacitance value than required. So which means I'm increasing the capacitance value. So if you don't do anything else, what will happen? The time constant R on C will also increase. Okay. So to make sure that we have the same uh, RC time constant to ensure the same tracking bandwidth, we need to reduce this R on value, right? Only then we'll have the same R on C. And once you reduce the R on value, what happens? This maximum current in turn will increase, right? And this will again increase the power consumption of the buffer that is driving the ADC. Okay. So that's what will happen if you use a much larger capacitance than that is required for the ADC. The circuit noise will also impact the sampling operation in an indirect manner, which is as follows. So let us say this is our clock that is controlling the sampling switch. So the falling edges define our sampling instant. Right? And ideally we want these falling edges to be spaced at Ts apart, right? Ts is the sampling period. So if I call this time instant as Ts, this will be two Ts, this will be three Ts and so on, okay? And usually this clock will be generated by some oscillator whose frequency is locked to the right value using a phase lock loop or a PLL. Right? And you learn more about this if you're taking the circuits for phase and frequency synthesis codes. Okay. And usually the output of the PLL will be given to some clock buffers like this. Okay. And that will then drive the switch. Okay. Now, because of the circuit noise that is generated in all of these, that is the phase lock loop and these buffers, what will happen is the following. The edges of the clock, instead of exactly falling at these time instants, they can fall somewhat early or somewhat late. Okay. And there is a window in which they can fall. So each of these edges, instead of exactly occurring at these specified time instants, 
they can occur at any random time instant within this window okay and this is called the clock jitter and what happens because of this well instead of sampling the input at nts we are now sampling it at nts plus some delta tn where delta tn is the error in the timing instant of the falling edge and this delta tn is going to be different for each time instant for example the first edge can occur here the second edge can occur somewhere here third edge can occur somewhere close like this and so right so let's see what happens because of this clock jitter so instead of having samples at v in of nps we are now going to take the samples at v in of nts plus delta t right so one thing we can observe the following this delta tn is not dependent on the input voltage right it is occurring due to the random circuit noise okay so as a result this delta tn is not uh, dependent on the input so we can expect that this will not introduce any kind of non linear right so delta tn is independent of input so which implies no distortion but what will happen is this will add to the overall noise of the adc so let us see how the spectrum of this look like and what is the noise power that is introduced because of this clock jitter okay so this is the actual samples that we take right and i can simplify it using taylor series as follows so i'll expand this around nts so i'll have v in of nts plus delta tn times first derivative of v in at nts and of course we'll have other higher order terms which i'll simply ignore for simplicity okay so this is the actual input sample we want and this is the error we are incurring due to the clock jitter so i'll simply call it v and j of n and this is dependent on delta tn and the slope of the input okay and why does this make sense well dependence on delta tn makes sense because if delta tn is large we will be sampling at time instant further apart from the actual timing instant so the error will be larger that is fine and it also depends on the product of delta tn with the slope and why does this make sense well if the input had zero slope that is if the input is not changing at all it doesn't matter even if you take the sample at ts that is say this point or ts plus some delta t right so if the input is not changing at all even if delta t is large the error you make will be zero right however if the input is changing rapidly say something like this even if you make a small error in the sampling time instant so instead of sampling at this point you sample at this point so delta t can be small but still the error you incur in the voltage samples is quite large right so the oops sorry so the voltage noise due to the clock jitter is delta tn times the slope of the input at nts right and if i say my input is a sinusoidal signal of the form a sin 2 pi fn times t what is the slope of the input at nts it is simply a times 2 pi fn times cos of 2 pi fn times nts and we know that 2 pi fn times ts is the equivalent discrete time frequency which i call as omega unit 
right? So my noise due to the jitter V and J of N is simply delta T N times A times two pi F N times cos of omega N times N. Okay. So let's see how the spectrum of this guy looks like. Well, the noise voltage V and J of N is the product of this sequence delta T N and cos omega in N, right? Please remember that delta T N is not a constant. It is a random sequence depending on the index N, right? So this is one sequence that is getting multiplied with cos omega N. So when we have the product of these two sequences, in convolution of this, which is S delta T of omega, convolved with the power spectral density of this. Of course, I'm ignoring the scaling factors for simplicity. Okay. And we know the spectrum of cos omega in will be delta of omega minus omega in plus delta of omega plus omega. In. Right. So if the jitter spectrum, that is the spectral density of delta Tn is indeed white, what will happen when we have convolution of these two? The spectrum of delta Tn, that is yes, delta T of omega, will just get shifted to these two frequencies, right? So this is simply S delta T of omega minus omega in plus S delta T of omega plus omega in, right? And if S delta T of omega is a white spectral density, even after shifting by omega in and minus omega in, we'll have the same white spectral density, okay? But let us say S delta T of omega has some kind of a shape like this, which might usually be the case when you take the output of a PLL. Let's say this is S delta T of omega. After shifting by omega in, how will it look like? If let us say this is my omega in, and if I just look at one side, I'll have something like this. So let's say this is zero and this is pi. Okay. So this will be my S, V, and J of omega. So if I look at the overall ADC output, what will what we'll have is the following. Let me just push it up. So let me draw it here. Since the input frequency is omega in, we'll have one impulse corresponding to the input sinusoid, right? We'll also have this spectrum due to the clock jitter that is around omega in like this. And on top of it, we will have both the quantization noise and the sample thermal noise, right? So it will be something like this. I'll say it's lower like this. Okay, so the overall spectrum at the ADC output might look something like this. Okay. So now let us say we want to find, we want to make sure that the noise added due to this clock jitter to be much smaller than the quantization noise or the thermal noise. So for that first, we need to find what is the mean squared value of this noise, right? So let's do that next. So what we are interested in is the expected value of V and J of N, V and J squared of N. And this is simply expected value of delta T N squared times A squared, four pi squared, F N squared, cos squared, omega N times N. Okay. And since this is constant, we can simply take it out. A squared, four pi squared, F N squared. And then we have the expectation of product of delta T n squared and cos square omega n. And please note that these two guys are completely independent, right? Delta T n is completely independent of the input signal 
So which means expectation of the product becomes simply product of the expectations. So we'll have expectation expected value of delta t squared times expected value of cos squared omega in times here. Okay. So this is simply a squared four pi squared f in squared. If I call expected value of delta t in squared to be some sigma squared delta t. Okay, so this is the mean squared value of delta t n squared. What is the expected value of cos square omega in n? Well, this guy is simply the mean squared value of cos omega in n. And this is simply half, right? So this is simply a squared 4 pi squared f n squared sigma squared delta t by 2. Okay. So this is the total noise power that is getting added due to the clock jitter. And now let us say we want to make this clock jitter to be much smaller than the thermal noise or the quantization noise. What do we do? We make sure this is less than 2 kT by C or delta square by 12, whichever you want. Okay. Let us say, for example, we have uh, the amplitude of the sinusoid to be 1 volt. And let's say we are targeting an input frequency of 100 megahertz. And let's say you want to make this noise power to be less than minus 80 dB. Right? So what we need to do, we need to make sure this is 10, eight minus 80 dB, that is 10 power minus 8. That is 1 squared into 4 pi squared is 100 mega squared times sigma squared delta t by 2. So from this we can find what sigma delta t and that comes out to be around 225 femtoseconds. Okay. This sigma delta t is nothing but the root mean squared of delta t and it's also known as the RMS jitter. Okay. So we want the sigma delta t to be 225 femtoseconds RMS, right? And if you want this noise power to be much smaller than minus 80 dB, what we'll need is the following. We will need the RMS jitter to be much smaller and it can be less than 100 femtoseconds also. And if you're taking the circuits for frequency synthesis course, you will learn that designing a clock, so clocking circuit that generates this clock with a very good clock jitter number is not so easy and it itself is requires some design, design effort. Okay. So the bottom line is the following. If you're targeting a very high frequency, and if you want to make sure that the clock jitter, the noise added due to the clock jitter is very small, you also need a very good circuit that generates this in clock for us. Okay. And of course, this becomes a bigger problem when you are targeting a very high signal frequency. And why is that? Well, because when the signal frequency is high, the signal is going to change rapidly. So even a small error in the sampling time instant will result in a large error in the sample voltage. Okay. And if you're targeting a low frequency input, this jitter will not be a great concern. Okay. So this is all about how circuit noise will impact our sampling operation. So let's move on to the third non-ideality we have in our sampling circuit, which is clock feed through. So ideally, this is our sampling switch, the sampling capacitor, and we have the input voltage, right? So we expect that the sampled output is V in of n. Okay. And when we want to turn the switch off, what we do, we make sure the clock is brought down from VDD to zero. But what happens when you do is the following. We know that a MOSFET has parasitic capacitors between each of its junctions. So let us say I have this capacitor, let's say it's CP. And from the base classes, you know what CP is, right? It's the 
gate to source and gate to drain capacitance. So let's not go into the details. It is say some parasitic capacitance C. Okay. So what will happen because of that is the following. So ideally, this is our sampling clock, and this is the falling edge of the clock. Okay. If let us say this is our input voltage, the capacitor voltage when the clock is on will track the input ideally like this and at the sampling instant exactly the capacitor value is frozen that is the output voltage of the capacitor is frozen and the voltage is held like this but because of this parasitic capacitance this change in the gate voltage from vdd to zero will also be coupled to the output okay and since we have a capacitance divider between cp and the sampling capacitor c what we have what we get to see following this jump in the gate voltage which is by an amount of vdd will get coupled to the output and the coupling amount will be vdd times cp by cp plus c, right it's just the capacitance divider between these two okay so instead of having a constant held output like this the output slightly jumps down and this value is this. Okay, so this essentially results in some kind of an offset voltage to the sampled output, right? And the important thing to note is that this offset value is going to be same for all the falling edges. It is not dependent on the input. So it's simply going to be a constant offset that is getting added to each of the sample voltage, right? And since this is a constant offset, this is not going to create a big issue. And when you take a differential circuit, okay, so we'll have the samples to be here, delta V in of N. This will be minus delta V in of N, right? And again, due to this parasitic capacitance, We'll have the same offset getting added to both the differential halves, right? So if you take the differential output, that is, you take the difference between these two output voltages, the offset voltage will simply get cancelled. Okay. So the bottom line is clock feed through is not a big issue, especially when you are using a differential sampling circuit. So now let's move on to the other non-ideality. So the fourth one, as we discussed earlier, is the signal dependent sampling instant. So what happens here is the following. So this is the switch we have, right? And ideally the clock, the switch, we expect it to be like this, right? It out cleanly. So ideally, we ex we expect that the clock makes a sharp transition from high to low and low to high, right? But in practice, this is not possible to realize. And let us say we have a very slow transition like this, right? The rise time and fall time are very high. Well, if the clock was falling down instantly, this would this would have been our sampling instant, right? But since the clock waveform is going down very smoothly, so if I if the clock waveform is say phi of t, what will happen is the following. So this is my input. This is also roughly the input. So the MOSFET will turn off only when the gate to source voltage becomes less than the threshold voltage, right? So only when this becomes equal to VTHN, the MOSFET is going to turn off. And the gate to source voltage is what? It is phi of t minus V in of t. Okay. So only at that only at that particular time instant, say T naught, when this is getting satisfied, the input is getting sample. Which means instead of taking samples at NTS, 
we'll now be taking the samples at NTS plus some delta TL. Although this might look similar to the case with the clock jitter, there is one important difference, which is the following. These sampling, uh, you know, time instance, delta TN, they are not independent of the input, right? They see, they are obviously dependent on the input itself. Okay, so since delta TN is dependent on the input, we can expect that this will result in some non-linearity, right? And we can clearly see it from this. So the samples are V in of NTS plus delta TN. And of course, delta TN is some function of the input voltage, right? So if we can expand it using Taylor series, we will get the following V in of NTS plus delta TN times first derivative of the input plus delta TN squared times second derivative of the input and so on, right? And since delta TN itself is a function of the input, this clearly results in nonlinearity. Okay. And Please notice that if we were actually using a gate bootstrap switch, the gate to source voltage usually is a constant, right? We make sure that the gate to source voltage is roughly equal to VDD. So this gate to source voltage will simply equal to be some phi of P. Okay, so this will have no dependence on the input and even the sampling instant will now no longer be dependent on the input. And so when you use a gate bootstrap switch, will not have this issue, right? But whenever we use a CMOS switch, we'll have this issue and we'll have nonlinearity, okay? And this is one more reason why, even if you make the, the condition to be mu n C ox W by L n, to be mu P C ox W by L times P in a CMOS switch, we will still have nonlinearity. This is one other, one other reason. And what is the solution to this problem? Well, the only solution to this problem is to make sure that the clock doesn't fall off very slowly. And we try to make it thrice sharp. Okay, so we try to make it rise and fall much sharply. Okay. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, want to set the clock has a finite rise and fall time because we are trying to drive the gate of the MOSFET using some kind of a clock buffer. And because of the parasitic capacitance at this node, the gate voltage takes some finite time to rise and fall, right? To make sure that this voltage rises up and falls down much quickly, say something like this, we just need to make sure that these inverters are stronger. That is, they are able to push in more current to this capacitor to make sure that the voltage rises quickly, right? So the only solution is to make these inverters stronger, which implies they will consume more power. Okay, so that's the only solution. So let's stop at this point and continue from the next class.